Okay, so today is the December full moon day. It's a very important day in Sri Lanka and in the Sri Lankan tradition. It's one of the most important uh, full moons through the cal uh, calendar year because uh, it's on this day that the Arahatnan Sangamitta brought the Bodhi tree from uh, Bodhgaya to Sri Lanka and established the Bhikkhuni order in Sri Lanka and also planted the tree which is still there today. So that tree was planted 2,200 years ago. It's really, really very old. If you've ever visited, you'll see uh, it's really old as well. It's being held up by crutches at the moment. Um, but it was planted 2,200 years ago. So I want to tell you something uh, about this story of how this happened tonight. Previously, I actually published this book, which is called Arahat Sangamitta's Story, and its translations from the extended Mahavamsa, the first translations made from that book, uh, which tells in extension about Arahat Sangamitta's story and the Bodhi tree. Um, there's no longer any copies. It was printed in KL a few years ago, uh, perhaps around 2011, and now there's no more copies, but you can find it online. So if you're interested, it's only a small book, only about 48 pages. Uh, but it's really well worth reading to understand more about the Ashokan missions and uh, the Arahat Nan Sangamitta's part in those missions and the arrival of the Bodhi tree in Sri Lanka. And the, it also goes up to the end, which is the passing away of the first missionaries. Now, it's very important, of course, because our own tradition and not our own tradition comes through the Sri Lankan tradition. But not only that, but our Bodhi tree is a sapling of this very Bodhi tree that was brought 2,200 years ago across the waters from uh, Bodhgaya uh, to Sri Lanka. Now then, about 200 years after the Buddha had attained his Parinibbana, there was a king, uh, King Bindusara, who had managed to unify uh, a large section of India and it had become what was basically quite a big empire stretching from the Indus River, which is around Pakistan, over to Bengal and down to what is now uh, Andhra Pradesh but not as far as Tamil Nadu, but nevertheless, it was big. It was bigger than, it, than India is now. And Bindusara had a son who was called Ashoka. And Prince Ashoka was originally sent to Awanti. Awanti is in the center of India. And uh, he was set, sent there to look after that district so the king's sons and his ministers and so on were looking after various areas in India. Ahsoka was looking after Awanti, an important center not far from the actual center of the empire in Magadha. And he got married and he had two children. Uh, the two children, of course, are Mahinda, who first took the Buddhist religion to uh, Sri Lanka, and Sangamitta, who was his sister, who later uh, brought the nun's order and the Bodhi tree to uh, Sri Lanka. And while they were growing up, Ahsoka's father, Bindusara, died in the capital, Pataliputta, that's what is now Patna, and Ashoka went back to the capital uh, and he, 
he had many brothers. In fact, in the traditional stories, it tells that he had a hundred brothers, 99 by different mothers, and one by the same mother. You understand, the kings had many wives in those days. So Ahsoka killed, Ahsoka killed those 99 brothers. Right. Ahsoka was originally known as Chanda Ahsoka. It means violent Ahsoka. He was really a ruthless, ruthless um, uh, person in his life. So he killed all these brothers by different mothers. But the one of, uh, that was by his own mother, who was called Tissa, he spared. Now later, Ahsoka, trying to expand the empire, went to Kalinga. Kalinga is now modern-day Orissa in, in eastern India, which had not been brought under the empire. And he waged war against Kalinga. And during that war, about a hundred thousand people died. It's really quite a lot. Uh, in those days, it was not as populated as it is now. Uh, that would have been a large percentage of the population. About a hundred thousand died. A lot of them died from fighting, but a lot of them died just from uh, starvation and from neglect, uh, from the fact that they couldn't look after themselves, and so on. And after the war, Ahsoka went to Kalinga, he went through the country, and he saw the devastation, and he saw, you know, the people, for a large part, were just left on the side of the road. There was nobody to bury them or anything. You understand? So they were just lying on the side of the road, and amongst them were also ascetics. Some of the ascetics also had died. And Ashoka really had a big change of heart when he saw how much destruction his war had made on the people. And it really turned his heart. He really repented of what he had done. And he decided from that time on he would have no more normal wars. That means fighting wars by force of arms. He was the strongest emperor in the world at the time. He had a massive empire at his uh, command and, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops and so on. But he decided that that was not the way to do, uh, to spread his empire, but he decided on what was called the Dhamma Vijaya, the conquest through Dhamma. That is, he would teach people how to live properly, how to live in a good way. He would teach them the Dhamma. And through teaching them the Dhamma, he would win over their hearts. So it's a really wonderful idea if you understand how violent he had been and what a change of heart he had had. And he decided to win people, not by force, but by showing a good example and uh, by teaching Dhamma. And you know, all the rock edicts and the pillar edicts that he had written, there were scores of them actually, uh, written throughout the empire, giving instructions in Dhamma and instructions on way to live well, way to live good. And he would have his uh, ministers uh, read out those pillars to the people because the people, of course, wouldn't be able to read. So Ahsoka had a change of heart and he wanted to conquer and extend his empire through Dhamma Vijaya, through the conquest by Dhamma. And one of the major things that he did in this regard was to send out the missionaries. Now up to that time, Buddhism, it had expanded with the Magadan Empire, so it was all over India, but it was only over India. But the Ashokan missions made all the difference. The reason that we now receive 
Buddhism and the Buddha's teaching is basically because Ashoka sent out these missions, they went out to far-flung areas beyond his empire and they traveled eventually, those teachings traveled into China, they traveled into Tibet, they traveled from Sri Lanka into Southeast Asia, into Indonesia, Malaysia and so on and so forth. So it's through the good works of Ashoka that we receive those teachings. Now one of the things is that he sent his own son, Mahinda, who had ordained by that time. He sent Mahinda to Sri Lanka. And Mahinda, along with five other monastics, traveled to uh, Sri Lanka and he met the king. And the king was very receptive. The king is Devanam Piyatissa, one of the great heroes in Sri Lankan history because it's through this king that they got the connection to Buddhism and they got the uh, sasana established. So the king, uh, while he was out hunting one day, came across these monks who had traveled from India and he was very impressed with these uh, monks and he invited them back to the city. The city is Anuradhapura. That was his capital city at that time. And then he set them up in a monastery south of the city. Uh, it was um, called the Great Cloud Monastery. And he invited them into Anuradhapura to give teachings. So they went into Anuradhapura in the daytime and they would give teachings and explanations about the Dhamma. And uh, many people were converted by the teachings, his ministers, the king himself of course, his ministers and uh, various important people, it means like merchants and so forth, also converted. One of the most important people who were converted was uh, Deva Nampiatissa's brother's wife, who was known as Queen Anula. So Queen Anula and a thousand uh, concubines, I suppose, from that, uh, from that palace, they also converted and they became Sotapanna. On listening to the Dhamma, they attained the first stage of awakening. And then later they heard again some more teaching from Mahinda and they attained the second stage, uh, Sakadagami. Uh, so then at that point they wanted to request ordination uh, because normally when people get to a certain level on the path, they will naturally request ordination and take ordination. In fact, normally it's said if somebody attains arahatship, they will ordain on that day, or if they don't ordain, it's because they died before they could ordain. So normally it's understood that people in a high, uh, high level of attainment will take ordination. So the queen and these 1,000 uh, ladies of the court requested ordination, but Mahinda was not able to give ordination to the nuns. It takes nuns to give ordination to the nuns. So he asked if he could send uh, somebody back to India and ask his sister, Sangamitta, to come over, and not only come over, but also to bring a branch of the Bodhi tree. That's the Bodhi tree under which the Lord Buddha had attained awakening. So he asked for two things, which is Sangamitta and the nuns. There had to be enough nuns to be able to give the ordination and the Bodhi tree. So one of his ministers, Aritta, went back to India and then requested uh, King Ashoka to send out Sangamitta. In fact, in the story, there's a very touching scene uh, where Ahsoka is kind of in two minds about whether to send Sangamitta because his brother Tissa had already ordained, 
his grandson had already ordained, his uh, son Mahinda had already ordained, and they had all left the court. They were no longer there. And the only person who was still there was his daughter, Sangamitta. And he, s he says to her, you know, if, if I send you, I will never see you again. I'm never going to see the others again. I'll never see you again. It's really, uh, the way it's told in the story, it's really quite moving because it's a, it's a matter of losing all his family members. But anyway, eventually he agrees that Sangamitta will go uh, and take the Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka. And then um, he accompanies the tree to the coast. Bodhgaya, of course, is not on the coast. It's quite way inland. So he, ac he accompanies the tree and Sangamitta and the nuns to the coast. And then they... Uh, board, before they board the ship, actual fact, he makes the tree just for a short time, he makes the tree emperor of the empire. And he tells the people who are taking the tree, when you get to Sri Lanka, you must pay similar respects to the tree. And he goes out into the water with the Bodhi tree, in a vase of course, on his head, and then he passes it to the ship, like this. Okay? And then the ship sets sail. So, so after the ship, ship had set, set sail, sail, it's going, going down, down and then, then the winds, winds dropped and, and they, they can no longer make any headway. The, the ship, ship is caught, caught and, and um, they, they wonder, wonder why. why. In, in, fact, in fact, what, what has, has happened, happened is that the Nagas have stopped the ship because, because they, they want, want to take the Bodhi tree to their Naga home and worship the Bodhi tree before it goes on. So, so they took the tree, tree Sangamitta agrees, agrees, okay? She so said, you can you take the tree and worship it for one week, week and, then and then you must, must bring, bring it back. back. So, so they agreed, agreed to bring, bring it back. back. And, and they, they brought, brought it back, back and then they put, put it back, back on, on the ship. ship. And, and when, when they get to Sri Lanka, then the king was waiting for them. That's Devanam Piyatissa. He was waiting for them and he come out into the sea up to his neck to receive the Bodhi tree off the, off the boat like this and then carried it back on to land himself. And they, they had great festivals at the coast. You can still go to this place where Sangamitta and the nuns and the Bodhi tree landed. There is, there is a spot it's called Jambukola. So you can, if you go to Sri Lanka, you can go to Jambukola so, so from, from Jaffna, Jaffna, they then, they then had, had a procession, procession all the way down, down to Anuradhapura. I don't know, it's co probably a couple of hundred kilometers. And then they planted that tree, only a sapling at that time, just a small tree. And that tree is still there to this day, 2,200 years later. And, and the, the nuns, nuns did, did uh, uh, that means the nuns, nuns who came, came from, from India, India did, did uh, ordain, ordain these, these ladies in waiting and the queen, and, and so, so there, there was, was, you know, you over a thousand, thousand nuns, nuns at the beginning of the sasana, sasana in, in Sri Lanka, Lanka. And, and the nuns, nuns had a very, very important, important role throughout, throughout the uh, history, uh, history of Buddhism, Buddhism in Sri Lanka. Lanka. Uh, uh, one, one of the, the things, things is that one of the the, the first chronicle that we know of. Uh, was, called was called Deepa Wamsa. Those, that first chronicle, it's now believed, was written by the nuns, and it records the history of the sasana down until their own time, which at that point was in about the 4th century AD. But even later than that, the nuns were playing a very important role in the uh, life of the sasana. Even today, as you know, uh, with, uh, with the revival, revival of the Bhikkhuni, Bhikkhuni order, order, one of the, the main, main uh, the main supports, supports for it has been the support that has come from Sri Lanka. Lanka. Because, because Arahat Sangamitta, everywhere, everywhere you go in Sri Lanka, Lanka you'll find places, places you'll find roads af named, named after her, Sangamitta Mawata and so on like this. She's so important. And this is one of the most 
important uh, days uh, in the year in Sri Lanka when they keep this celebration. And um, from that time, the, the king started building chaitiyas, he planted the Bodhi tree, he also, uh, you know, set up the uh, Buddha rupas and so on. All the main objects of worship that we now worship today, the king established monasteries, temples, chaitiyas, shrines, and so on and so forth like this. So this has come down. Even the uh, Mahavihara, which was the main center for Theravada orthodoxy, up until probably up until the Portuguese time, when the Portuguese invaded in the 16th century, up until that time, that was the leading center for the Theravada teaching uh, for probably 1,500 years or so. So that was also established by uh, Devanam Piyatissa. So this is the a history of the nuns, of the Bodhi tree, and the uh, establishment of the sasana in Sri Lanka. It's very important, of course, because it's through this tradition that the Theravada has come down from us, come down to us. It's actually from the Sri Lankan Sangha that it eventually went to Thailand, to Burma, it also, also, for that, that matter, matter uh, went, went out, out to Southeast, Southeast Asia, Asia as well. As well. So, so it's a very, very important, important day. day. So, so everybody, everybody say, say sadhu. sadhu.